Well, UFC 203 ends up being one of the most bizarre and memorable events of 2016. Dare I say, a perfect event for one Chuck Mendenhall to cover. Really this is right up his alley. Can't wait to get his thoughts. Officially, Stipe Miocic, he retains his UFC heavyweight title. He defeated Alistair Overeem in the first round in a very entertaining affair. Fabricio Verdum, he defeated <laughs> Travis Brown in... Well, a very weird affair. And CM Punk loses to Mickey Gall via first round rear naked choke. Let's start with the main event. Wow. That crowd was unbelievable. I said on Twitter it was louder than any arena. Maybe even Dublin. Deafening. Mm -hmm. Were you impressed? Definitely. Um, it's funny because we were talking about how kind of quiet it's been in the lead yeah. up to this fight. I felt like this made up for it entirely. Um, even when Jessica I came out on the prelims, I felt like it was getting this enormous pop that you would normal you would not get that sort of thing um, for loyalty in another city. I don't think. I mean, it was just it, Cleveland really bands together for its athletes apparently. And uh, yeah, when he came out, it was um, it was pretty it was pretty deafening in there. Like you're, I knew you were saying, there's a uh, ringing in yours. There wasn't mine too. It was just kind of pandemonium there for a few minutes. Yeah, 18,000 plus. It was a sellout, 2.6 million dollar gate. I mean, this was a huge success for the UFC, and in the end, the crowd goes home happy. But it got a little dicey there for a second. Um, early on, Miocic got dropped, and Overeem went for the guillotine. Now he claims after that Miocic <laughs> tapped. But the replay suggests that he did not tap. Do you think he tapped? No, he did not tap. Um, and that was a really weird way of going <laughs> yes. about finding out that he did not tap. Uh, Explain Joe, it. Joe, well, in, in the aftermath, uh, there's still 18,000 people um, booing Alistair Overeem in the cage. And Joe Rogan takes him to task and shows the uh, on the on the big, big jumbo screen that they have here. Um, <laughs> They walk through it twice to basically say, where's the tap? Where's the tap? You know, so um, he did not tap. And I don't know where that even came from. It was a little strange for that to even come out because at the time, I didn't really think that, you know, obviously you don't see everything from cage side, but I, I was, uh, I didn't know, I didn't hear anybody talking about a tap, nothing like that. So it sort of came out of the, um, out of the blue, but good for Miocic. Uh, he got put into a crazy position there. I know the crowd was on, there's like very tense in that building um, when it looked like he might be going out early and, we talked about this a little bit, like what happens if Miocic loses, how it's going to be like this funereal vibe in this place. But uh, he was able to recover and, and kind of chase him down, it seemed like, through that yeah. whole first round and just get, get exactly what he wanted in the end. Yeah, he uh, avoided, obviously, a huge disaster. He weathered that storm. And, you know, we talked on Friday about how this year in the UFC, titles have been changing hands almost every event. That's not the case for this one, so that streak is broken. But do you feel like he keeps saying, I'm going to hold the belt for a long time? Does he have what it takes? You know, based on what you saw tonight and what you've seen out of his career, once he starts fighting the, the Canes and maybe a JDS again, a Barnett, who knows, does he have what it takes to hold the belt for a long time? I think so. Um, you know, he does have wrestling, too. Uh, and that's always one of those things you, you think about a guy that, that size, um, you know, if, if he's able to be moved around, it could be a different fight and lead somebody to, to – um, into their wheelhouse and setting them up. But I feel like he's able to dictate a lot, and we saw that a lot tonight, um, where he was chasing Al Alistair over him around. Now, somebody like Cain Velasquez, that, that brings up a whole different intriguing um, set of matchup in terms of all their disciplines. But I think so, because he has that power. He's a, he's a good boxer. You know, he's very precise, and he's very he's pretty patient, really, when it comes down to it. You, you'll see him setting his shots up a little bit more than some of the guys who just start winging it in there. But of course, being the heavyweight division, uh, there's a reason that the, the record is two defenses in a row, which I guess he chides if he beats Velasquez, yeah. he ties Velasquez, but uh, or if he fights Velasquez, I guess. But um, it's it, it'll be tough for him to do it. But I think he does have, um, you know, he's got the skills to do it. He could he could be the guy out of all those guys that we've talked about through uh, heavyweight history, including Verdum, who has really shown well um, up to this point and it could be considered one of the best of all time. Um, he wasn't able to do that, so. Um, but, I, you know, it, it's wait and see, but I think he's got the tools. Yeah, it was interesting to hear him talk afterwards about how he'd rather fight in Brazil than fight at home again because uh, this is a guy who's talked about hating getting on flights, especially long ones. But then at the end, he kind of rectified the, yeah. the statement and said, no, he loves fighting at home. And you'd think that they'd want to book him back here. Now, you talked about Cain Velasquez. Is that the fight, in your opinion? And doesn't it make all the sense in the world to do it right back here in Cleveland? 100%. That's exactly what I thought. You When you're in this building, though, I was in Vancouver, for instance, uh, a couple weeks back, and the building is just not full. It doesn't have this kind of energy. When you come to a market and you galvanize that market just like this, and, and honestly, Ohio in general, because they haven't really been coming to Ohio anymore, um, 
and you know, since maybe you know, but back in the day, Rich Franklin was a guy from here. I feel like Ohio really gets behind its athletes, and it seemed like Cleveland especially. I would do that for sure. I mean, where else would you get Miocic? Where is Miocic ever going to get that pop elsewhere? Right. Um, he'd have to be in somebody else's backyard that's going to get that sort of enthusiasm. So, yes, I would do Cain Velasquez. I think I, you know, the way he was able to uh, um, showcase, I guess, over at UFC 200, it just sets up a really fun, intriguing fight. Uh, it's too soon. To, I, I know Verdum wants the fight, but it, it seems a little too soon for right. for me. And you got guys like JDS out there. You could do that rematch with him. And I don't know. To me, that's the fight that would make the most sense. Okay, let's talk about Fabricio Verdum okay. since you brought it up. I mean, holy moly. There were like eight different weird things that happened in that fight from the start of it to the end. If someone said, tell me about the uh, Verdum-Brown rematch, how would you describe it? Man, Bedlam? No, I don't know. It's... Uh, it was just, it was very odd to be cage side for it because at first I didn't even know like in that first round there was a stoppage obviously and um, Verdum is still coming on and throwing punches and I thought that maybe he was kicked in the groin I didn't know what was going on um, but obviously in the end the aftermath we learned that was a finger injury which never should have been there should have been no timeout you know um, so that whole thing was bizarre just the way that was set up and not to mention at the time you know you see Verdum go up and he's de demonstratively making his case and he's actually almost pushing the referee um, <laughs> while he's doing it. And I was like, I was like, wow, this is kind of crazy. You don't see guys putting hands on the referee. So I'm thinking all that. And then, of course, in the aftermath, you realize it was a referee's mistake to begin with. Yeah, and it started out with him throwing this flying kick. He said he's done it twice before. Yeah. He did it once in jungle fight against Gabriel Gonzaga, another time in pride against Alistair Overeem. Um, he ends up winning the fight. It's strange. He was flopping at times. Uh, Brown, I mean, the whole thing was just weird and certainly not the kind of fight that is going to get him a title shot. I know he's trying to make the case in his sort of inimitable way. But in the aftermath, while they're waiting for the scorecards to be announced, Edmund Tarverdian, who was sort of making his own headlines throughout the fight by like dressing down mm -hmm. Travis Brown in the in the corner, he starts yelling at Verdum, and then Verdum push kicks him, and then Tarverdian gets kicked out of the cage. I mean, just truly bizarre <laughs> stuff. Do you think Verdum should be punished for hitting the coach, or does the coach Tarverdian deserve the blame for starting the whole thing? Truthfully, I don't know. I haven't really went back and watched it, but it looked like, from what I was able to tell, it wasn't much of a kick. It was more like a, a space-clearing technique <laughs> to be like, hey, get off of me, don't come near me. Um, and, you know, the one thing I said, I only saw, like, a, a, a quick thing on it, and it did look like Edmund was the one kind of coming at him barking. We, we just heard Verdum saying, you know, I thought, that he, I thought he wanted to hit me. He looked like a man who was going to try to hit me, so he's just trying to basically defend himself. This is one of those weird situations. Um, I'm gl it seemed like it was going to escalate there for a minute, even beyond that, because uh, even Rafael Carrero, um, Cordero was then charging against uh, Tiverdian, and it just seemed like something was going to go on there. Uh, you saw other guys kind of stepping up, so I I'm glad that it didn't escalate beyond where it did. But uh, I don't know. Uh, I'd have to really go back and, and look at it. I don't think so. It just seemed like it seemed like Verdum really was just sort of thought he was going to be attacked or something. Sure. Although he did start dancing like yeah, he was ready to roll. So we'll see. Uh, Verdum gets to win. His manager, Ali Abdelaziz, telling me after the press conference that he suffered a fractured right foot three weeks ago, uh, visited the doctor last night, got a shot tonight at around 8.30 p.m. Wow. Eastern time. So this was a guy who was fighting pretty hard, and some people were commenting on his physique, couldn't really train in the last three weeks. Wow. So puts the win in a different kind of perspective. Now, JDS was sitting in the front row. I kind of like that fight next, mm -hmm. especially given their history. Uh, JDS knocked him out of the yeah. UFC several years ago. Do you agree? 100%. Uh, UFC 90, right? It was the, the Chicago card. Yeah. Um, the way that that ended, you know, Verdum getting knocked out, and it was JDS's coming out party. It was like his debut, right? So uh, he was, you know, the, the new thing in the division. I just feel like... Verdum being a competitor that he is and haven't fought all the guys he's fought since then, that makes a lot of sense, especially where the two guys are sort of at in this in this division with Cain Velasquez probably sitting just above them. And I know Verdum could say, like, you know, look what happened with me and Velasquez, but it's always a it's always one of those things you have to look at the whole picture and be like, well, which fight draws the most enthusiasm at this moment? And I think both those fights, if you separate them, you have Verdum JDS and you have Velasquez and Miocic. I think that those are the two most attractive fights going right now. All right, now let's talk about the big one. CM Punk makes his long-awaited, much-anticipated MMA and UFC debut. He comes out to Cult of Personality. That was, awesome. that was a great moment. The crowd loved it. Mickey Gall takes him down in the opening seconds. Two minutes or so later, he taps him out via rear naked choke. 
the the chapter that is CM Punk in the UFC, at least the first chapter, has been written. We don't know what his future holds. He doesn't know. He hasn't been told. But it sounds like it's kind of up in the air, mm -hmm. to be fair. How would you write this chapter? How would you grade this whole experiment now that it's officially over? Well, he seemed pleased but hurt, you know, that he didn't perform better and that he lost the fight ultimately. I thought it went down pretty close to the way I thought it might. You know, um, I didn't really anticipate him charging out quick as quickly as he said. He wanted to crowd him and put pressure on him because I think he thought um, Gall hadn't been tested that way, but there wasn't much tape, obviously, to see how he reacts to anything. Obviously, he reacted very well, and it seemed sort of academic from that point. But I will say, like, and I know we were talking about this a little bit, you know, uh, it wasn't like he was just gone within seconds of that. You know, he fended off um, for a little while there, and I was I was pretty impressed with that that side of him. It was clear that he's been um, not wasting his time, you know, as he's trying to put together the tools in this sport. Ultimately, you know, it's it's about what I expected, though, to be honest. I mean, you you just you can't expect a guy like that to show up and um, and do crazy things in the sport when they don't have any professional fights. Um, and it's an interesting situation. Like, we, we were talking about how crazy this whole setup is and everything. And um, for a guy like Mickey Gall, it's just such a strange trajectory. We're sitting in here, and you're like, what a, he's a great kid. He's calling out uh, Sage Northcutt, you know, and uh, you're, you're thinking, that's an interesting fight. Maybe that would make more sense. But how many guys have their maybe their toughest fight outside the UFC prior to going to the UFC, get discovered, and then come to the UFC and basically have two fights that – don't make as much sense. I don't know. Right. So it's like, I just feel like his trajectory has been so weird. The whole thing has been very weird. I'd be real shocked if CM Punk gets another fight in the UFC. I just think that's too much of a compromise for what the UFC is about. And, you know, it's something that we saw. I just, I can't imagine them doing it again, to be honest. Yeah, so you wouldn't. If you're the UFC, you, you cut no. ties, even if that means Bellator or someone else picking him up. Yes, and I mean, that would obviously be like someplace like that. But if I was CM Punk and I want to actually do this I know he's 37 but he wants to try it for a while I may not even go that direction although I will say that Bellator would probably accommodate him a little bit more on his level this seemed like a big too big of a step for him yeah. I know we talked about this a little bit um, maybe the Mike Jackson fight would have made more sense or somebody like Mike Jackson's caliber um, you're not getting the greatest MMA obviously but at the same time you're giving him a, a fair a fair chance to shine I guess in that sort of setting but um, wherever he goes I'm, I'm sure he'll be met more on his level I think it's fair to say that CM Punk looked like a guy who was 0-0, who had never fought amateur or pro, who doesn't have much of a combat sports or martial arts background, but didn't look worse than that. A guy of that caliber fighting in the UFC in his first fight. Like I, I had some people say, oh, that was embarrassing, that was pathetic. That was how a guy at his level should look in his first UFC fight. Do you understand yeah. what I'm saying? Do you agree? 100%. And I, I guess really the discrepancy is that he shouldn't be at this level. Right. That's the whole thing. I mean, he just shouldn't be there. But for a guy, given his reality, what he was coming in with, yeah, I thought he showed exactly how I thought he might. Actually, to the high end of maybe how he, how he thought he might. Because there was a real chance he'd come in and be humiliated on a level that he wasn't just a one-sided beatdown, but like humiliated because he just didn't look like he knew what he was doing. Right. It didn't seem like that. I mean, he was on the ground. He was doing some stuff that made you think like, hey, he knows what he's doing. Intuitively, he was doing some stuff... Uh, um, that sort of gave him some some merit, you know, in my mind. But like you said, it's just I think it's just too big of a uh, too big of a step for him. If he had won the fight, if somehow kind of crazy, I, I I kept wondering what that would be like because then you have to um, sort of reevaluate the whole situation sure. and think like, wow, this guy is like a uh, this he, this folk hero just can <laughs> come into our sport or something like that. But um, it didn't work out, I, you know. And it's just I don't think he needs to hang his head, you know, in the sure. end. And he was taking it pretty hard. Um, I think even if he would have won that fight, the ceiling still would have been pretty low. With Mickey Gall winning, it feels like there's a greater upside. Mm -hmm. And then when you consider how young he is, um, how he talks on the mic, you know, the things he was saying in the post-fight interview, the things he was saying at the press conference, I maintain that they booked this the right way. Mm -hmm. They didn't book him against a part-time firefighter who's 40 years old with a beer belly, and they can't do anything with him now. Right. They've got something on their hands here, and I think a Mickey Gall versus Sage Northcutt fight would draw pretty well. I feel like this was kind of a win-win for the UFC. Yeah. They got the CM Punk, you know, buzz, so to speak. It, it lasted a little longer than they probably would have liked, and now they got a kid mm -hmm. that they can actually groom. He he impresses me. Does he impress you as well? After tonight, yes. Um, I, I think he handles himself very well. Uh, you know, co coming in, I wasn't sure. I, I, you know, you, you wonder, like, star quality is so hard to really identify until you see them in big moments and how they kind of handle it. 
you know, he handled his moment perfectly. I mean, he was very calm and being bull rushed essentially in that fight and was able to pull that out. But then he gets on the microphone and, um, you know, he, he's got a – and he's one of the guys, you know, he's a rookie, but he said he's a thinker, and I believe that. He's he's always thinking one step ahead. Well, how did Conor McGregor where he get where he is? It's always thinking one step ahead, right, like having somebody's name to call out or um, ruffle somebody's feathers. And he basically did that by calling out Sage Northcutt, and he clarified it during our press conference that he wanted it at MSG. Yes, and, I mean, what a great little, you know, addition that would be, you know, for that kind of fight. And uh, he seems to not be afraid of the spotlight, yeah. you know, and that, that shows when he asks for a guy like Sage Northcutt, who's also in the spotlight. So it tells me he doesn't want to lose the spotlight, but he sure. wants a competition that sure. matches him. That is all very refreshing in, in, in a day and age where you hear a lot of, I'll take whoever the UFC wants, uh, you know, I'll take whoever Joe Silva wants. Yeah. It, it, it's kind of fun to see these sorts of stories. Um, elsewhere on the card, Jimmy Rivera of New Jersey defeated Uriah Faber. First time in Uriah Faber's career that he is on a two-fight losing streak. Wow. I mean, the first losing streak of his illustrious career. Also, Jessica Andrade with a big win over Joanne Calderwood. Betch Cohea with a somewhat controversial win over Jessica I. Anyone you want to talk about before we finally say goodnight from here in Cleveland? Maybe Nick Lentz. Uh, he, That's he, right. Yeah, Nick Lentz, I mean, he looked good. I mean, uh, fighter of the night? If I there was so. one. I didn't really think it was close. Did you? No. I, he, he, he killed did. it in his post-fight scrum, <laughs> dropping a bomb on BJ Penn. <laughs> I haven't seen that. Trust yet. me on this okay. one. You All will right. like it. All right. <laughs> so Nick Lentz. Well, I just you know, Nick, look, he won. So What more can be cool. said? All right. That's pretty He's cool. back. <laughs> He's the carny. Back. Yeah. That's it? That's it. That's your closing thought. <laughs> well, uh, how about Drew Dober? That was a pretty good <laughs> That was a pretty good fight. That was a good I mean, fight. I mean, he when he and that that poor guy, you know, he, he kicks him in the groin, he recovers and then he just assaults him on the fence and yeah, that was yeah. a Every now and again, you'll see uh, a barrage like that, and, you, and it just seems like the sport becomes that much, like up a notch of sure. how violent it can get sometimes. Because, I mean, he, he unleashed on him. Um, it was right where I was sitting in my line of view there. So that was also equally impressive. All right. It has been fun, my friend. What a memorable one, right? Don't get on any elevators. That's right. We are taking <laughs> the stairs out of the queue here in uh, Cleveland. You know, how about this piece of irony? Alistair Overeem walked out tonight to the cage in the main event, he walked out, his song of choice was the old Pride theme song, which I thought was a nice little nod to the hardcores who have been watching him for so long. Here's a guy who debuted in the 90s and maybe the last fighter to debut in the 90s to get his first UFC title shot in this era. Here he is giving that nod. And I wonder, and I wonder how many of those fans who were marking out for that song were the same ones who were saying that the CM Punk experiment in the UFC was a disgrace. <laughs> and I wonder how many of them failed to realize that the CM Punk experiment in the UFC was vintage Pride, mm -hmm. was straight out of the Pride playbook. It was Pride 101. Don't forget about the history of the sport. What we witnessed tonight is not new. It was not unique to the sport. It was not unique to UFC 203. It has happened time and again, and guess what? It is going to happen again. Mark his words. Mark my words. It was fun to cover. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. That's it for us. It was a fun time here in Cleveland from Wednesday all the way to early Sunday morning. We appreciate very much you watching our coverage all week long. Back on Monday for the MMA Hour. We have a lot to discuss, but for now we say good night or good morning from the 216. Again, thank you so much for watching. Stipe Miocic is the reigning and now defending UFC heavyweight champion. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.